Hello, this is Lisa, CEO of Site for White, welcoming you to this week's Talking News on Friday, the 8th of September 2023. So firstly, yes, it is Friday. I have always been saying Saturday, but a couple of the members said, well, actually, we listen to it on Friday. So happy Friday and happy Saturday for those listening on different days. Millbrook House came alive again this week with all of the clubs being restored. Mix and mingle on Thursday, swing on Monday, coffee morning on Wednesday, yoga on Tuesday and staff back out visiting various coffee mornings and get togethers around the island. Next week, of course, brings our September open day. This is being held at the first Newport Scout Hall, which is called Wenders Hall, and it's on Woodbine Close up above the Newport bus station. We are offering transport from the bus station at 11.30, 12.30 and 1.30. And please do book in advance if you do need it by calling the office on 5 22205. Also next week, blind veterans will be visiting us on Tuesday. So if you would like to have an appointment with them, please don't hesitate to give us a call and we can book you in. Also this week we had our members chat and feedback session and I'll be taking the points forward to the next meeting which is due to be held in about December, the dates to follow. So I hope everybody's enjoying this beautiful sunshine. My foot is still very much in a boot which I have to be honest is a little bit cumbersome and hot in this weather but the recovery is moving forwards finally. Lisa, CEO, Site for White, thank you. Here is this week's charity news. Swimming is at Medina Leisure Centre every Monday during term time between 1.15 and 2.15. This group is open to everyone and even if you just want gentle exercise in the water, we have the use of the whole pool so there is plenty of room for all to enjoy. Our IT drop-in resumes at Millbrook House on Monday 9.30 until 12.30pm. Tuesday's yoga is cancelled this week, but will resume next week, the 19th. Yoga is open to all and is between 1.45 and 2.45 here at Millbrook House. We will be at our place, Moa Place, Freshwater, on Tuesday. This is a community cafe held at the West White Sports Centre between 10.30 and 12.30. Please come along to chat to one of our staff regarding help and advice. Our coffee and chat held on Wednesdays will be held this week at the First Newport Scout Hall as we will be there with our open day. Please do come along and have a coffee and chat with us. As previously mentioned, it is our open day on Wednesday at the first Newport Scout Hall, St John's Road in Newport, between 11am and 3pm. We have a variety of stalls and also will be serving refreshments all day. This year, it is a far more community-based day with local charities and organisations. Next Saturday, we will be at the Isle of Wight Day at Braiding Roman Villa. Our trustees will be running the stand with Beat the Goalie and Hook a Duck. If you attend the event, please say hello. We had a very successful Wolverton Fair where we raised over £450. A massive thank you to all our wonderful volunteers who helped out over the weekend. Please remember, if you wish to join us either on Wet Wheels on September the 18th or Warner's holiday break in October, you must call the office and put your name on our list. We are very pleased to announce we have been donated a beautiful hand-sewn quilt which we have decided to raffle. You can buy a square for £2 from the office. The draw will take place on December the 13th and it is a king-size quilt. Hello, this is Steve reading a story from the Island Echo, headlined Isle of Wight, an exciting opportunity for innovative green energy physics. Multi-million pound plans for a new cross-solent power cable to accelerate key low-carbon projects and help deliver net zero was discussed when the government's energy chief visited the Isle of Wight recently. Jonathan Brearley, the chief executive of Ofgem, met with senior officials from Isle of Wight Council and network operator SSEN following an invite by Council Leader Laura P.C. Wilcox at last year's Islands Forum in Orkney. 
She was keen for the head of the UK's energy watchdog to find out more about energy cable capacity issues, which threatened to hamper efforts to grow the island's renewable energy production, and possible solutions being developed by SSEN in close coordination with the council and local bodies. This could include major investment by SSEN in a new energy cable between the island and the mainland to boost capacity for renewable energy and storage projects and for the expected new demands from electric vehicles and heat pumps. Mr Brearley outlined the work that would need to be done before the grid investment could be approved and recognised the grid constraints experienced by the island would also be felt by many other areas as the energy system is transformed. However, he added, the island would make an excellent test bed for some of the proposed solutions. In a letter of thanks to the council following his visit, Mr Brearley said, I hugely enjoyed my trip to the Isle of Wight, and it was great to hear about your proposals to meet the island's net zero target. I agree that the island is a really exciting opportunity to pilot projects as we look for innovative solutions to the UK's energy transition. I am very supportive of the ongoing work to examine these projects more closely. As part of a tour organised by SSEN, Mr Brearley visited Homestead Solar Farm, owned by White Community Energy, Cowes Power Station, owned by RWE, and a major substation owned and operated by SSEN. The Council has a vision for the island of being a centre of excellence for renewable energy. Councillor PC Wilcox said, We are serious about achieving the ambitious net zero targets outlined in our Mission Zero Climate and Environment Strategy and to sustaining the biosphere. Significant network investment will be required to achieve this and it was good to hear that SSEN is keen to make that investment to support the island. I think Mr Brearley took away the fact that there is a strong pipeline of local projects and a community keen to be involved in the transformation. I wish to thank him for taking the time to visit the island. Patrick Irwin, Commercial Director of SSEN Distribution, said, We have a shared vision of the electricity network accelerating local net zero ambitions and driving the local economy and prosperity. This visit was a fantastic opportunity to share our plans for strategic network investment on the island, which are the result of close coordination with both Isle of Wight Council and community representatives. Investment in the network on the island will be a key step in helping to meet the net zero vision for the Isle of Wight. Following the positive response from Ofgem, we look forward to further co-development of these plans and securing the regulatory approval to proceed. Hello, this is an article from the Isle of Wight Radio, read by Sue. Ride doctor's surgery saved from closure thanks to a takeover. An Isle of Wight doctor's surgery has been saved from closure, health bosses have revealed. A new partnership will take over the reins at Argyle House in Ryde, just months after the current partners announced they would be stepping away. The threat of closure caused huge public concern and outcry from both patients and their representative groups. In July, the surgery's manager sent a notice of closure to the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Integrated Care Board, ICB, which oversees healthcare on the Isle of Wight, saying they would be handing back their contract. No closure date was given and registered patients were told to carry on using the surgery as normal. But it sparked fears of more pressure being piled onto the already stretched services. Yesterday, which is Monday, Isle of Wight GP, Dr Michelle Legg, clinical director for the island on the ICB, confirmed Argyle House will be staying open after all. Speaking at a meeting of the Isle of Wight Council's Health and Social Care Scrutiny Committee, Dr Legg revealed a new primary care partnership will take on Argyle House and continue to deliver services. Manager of a patient watchdog, Joanna Smith, said Health Watch Isle of Wight had received a significant number of concerns and some said patients had already moved to other practices. Worries were also raised with the other local GPs. She said calling this week's announcements good news for the wider ride community. 
Reacting to the news, Isle of Wight councillor Phil Jordan said it come as a great relief to residents, adding he was pleased a solution had been found. Councillor Jordan said he is looking forward to welcoming the new team of doctors. Meanwhile, Chair of the Health Scrutiny Committee, Councillor Michael Lilly, thanked the ICB for meeting with patients. Duke of Edinburgh's Award Gold Achievers Honoured. From the Isle of Wight Radio, read by Lee. Two young islanders have been congratulated for their efforts and achievements in the Duke of Edinburgh's Award, D-O-F-E. Ruth Gale and Anila Nemiak were presented with their gold D-O-F-E awards by the Chairman of the Isle of Wight Council, Councillor Claire Quitcherson, at a ceremony at County Hall. Both have been progressed from their silver level to the top award, despite coronavirus restrictions and leaving school to attend university on the mainland. Each of the DOFE awards require the candidate to demonstrate aptitude in key areas, volunteering, physical, skill, expedition and working with the team on a residential activity. Ruth and Anila were supported initially by the Island Innovation VI form at the Isle of Wight Education Federation and latterly by Newport Open Award Centre. They persevered with volunteering activities, Ruth as sports secretary for her university, university geography society and Anelia as a netball coach to the junior team. The pair also learnt new skills, Ruth learning to cook and Anelia coxing the rowing eights at Oxford Brooks University. They are both keen sports enthusiasts and despite the challenges of the pandemic, Ruth managed to play netball and organise her own fitness programme while Anila participated in park run and her own running routes. Both were part of an expedition to Exmoor and qualifying venture to Dartmoor. Finally, they had to attend a residential course in Swanage to participate in water sports. The young women have matured during their time with the award and will soon be attending a celebration of achievement at one of the London palaces. Ask what had motivated her to complete her gold DOFE award, Ruth said, During sixth form, we were encouraged to take part in DOFE and we both really enjoyed the new experiences it brought. It was a great opportunity to give something back to the community through volunteering and the sense of adventure we got from the expeditions was addictive. Anila said, the DOFE award is a remarkable award and we are both proud to have achieved gold. We were motivated through our love for adventure and the great outdoors as well as volunteering in the community and giving our time to help others. Furthermore, Ruth and I have gone the extra mile and are Duke of Edinburgh ambassadors, inspiring the next generation to participate in the programme. We now await our invitation to the palace. Councillor Critchison added, I congratulate Ruth and Anila on such tremendous achievement. They have much to be proud of in achieving their gold DOFE awards, and it is my hope that the skills they developed by taking part stand them in good stead in their future endeavours. This is Dane reading an article from Isle of Wight Radio. Future of Children's Services on Isle of Wight under Council Scrutiny The Isle of Wight Council is set to take another step towards resuming control of its children's services next week. Senior councillors will consider proposals to take back overall leadership and management of all children's services functions, including education, when they meet on Thursday the 14th of September. Today's Cabinet report follows Hampshire County Council's request to end the current decade-long strategic partnership arrangements from the 31st of January 2024, in order to focus on children in its own county. The partnership was initiated by the Department for Education at what was a time of significant challenge for the island's educational provision and its social care services for vulnerable children. Over time, the two authorities have worked diligently together 
to improve standards in these areas and to share and strengthen the island's overall leadership of children's services. The partnership has evolved over the years to one where the island can now look to the future with renewed resilience, strength and good support for local children and families. Today's report reflects the Council's commitment to ensuring a smooth and efficient transition, one which not only maintains a good standards of practice, but continues to deliver improvements with minimum disruption to services. To help achieve this, the paper is recommending a bespoke buyback arrangement, initially for a period of 12 months, enabling the Council to purchase specialist service support from Hampshire. This could be where there is a cost benefit to the island, or where there is a national shortage in expertise, such as the Educational Psychology Service, but are essential to a high-performing service. Central to a successful tra transition will be the appointment of a Director of Children's Services that has sufficient reputation and standing and comes from a local authority which is rated good or outstanding by Ofsted. The current strategic partnership costs the Council around £1.64 million each year. In addition, there is a £1.2 million annual charge for support services, such as school improvement and out-of-hours social work support. The new in-house structure is expected to cost the Island Council about £2 million. Other options for the future of the service, including creating a new strategic partnership with a different organisation, creating a not-for-profit trust outside the control of the Council, or aligning children's services with adult social care under one directorship, are not being recommended. Council leader and education lead, Councillor Laura Pacey Wilcox, said, the Council's Cabinet will meet next week to decide the best way forward. A first priority must be to ensure a smooth and efficient transition to whatever new partnership or arrangement is best for us going forward. The issue is of such fundamental importance to the future of the island that nothing less is appropriate. Today's report and recommendations are the first steps as we move forward with a new focus on how we can develop and deliver the very best solutions for children's services and education on the island for our children's futures. The Cabinet report can be read in full on the Council's website. Hi, this is Steve reading a story from Isle of Wight Radio, headlined Sandown's Heights to Remain Open Despite Structural Safety Concerns. An Isle of Wight leisure centre is still open despite the presence of concrete which has been a cause of 100 school closures across England. Isle of Wight Council has confirmed that reinforced, autoclaved, aerated concrete otherwise known as RAC, R-A-A-C, is present in a small area of the roof at the heights in Sandown. A spokesperson said they are fully aware of the situation and it is being appropriately monitored and managed. The leisure centre is still open and there is no indication it will have to close, although a further report is being conducted. A council spokesperson said the authority's priority must be for the safety of residents and it would not hesitate to close facilities should it have any concerns. Last week, the Council instructed a further report of the affected area at the Heights so it could be confident it has the most up-to-date information on the condition of the structure. Isle of Wight Council has been asked when it first knew that RAC was present in the roof but no answer has been received. RAC is a lightweight form of concrete and was used in the construction of schools, colleges and other buildings between the 1950s and the mid-1990s. Paired with poor maintenance and old age, RAC has led to concerns prompting a warning from the Department for Education for schools to stop using buildings unless there are measures in place to make them safe. Hello, this is an article from the Island Echo, read by Sue. Four... Isle of Wight School was being inspected for RAAC concrete amid national crisis. 
The Department for Education has been inspecting four Isle of Wight schools to rule out the presence of reinforced, autoclaved, aerated concrete known as RAAC. Last week, Island Echo reported that no schools on the Isle of Wight are affected by the government's decision to close buildings built with a certain type of concrete. It came after the Isle of Wight Council confirmed that no local schools are thought to be built from this type of crumbling concrete. However, it has now emerged that the DFE has been surveying four island schools where the Portsmouth Diocese is the responsibility body. It is a result of incomplete information being provided back to the government. Three of the four surveys have already been completed, even though records do not show these schools to be at risk of having RAAC. A spokesperson for the Diocese of Portsmouth has told Island Echo, Our records suggest that no Church of England school on the Isle of Wight is at risk from reinforced autoclaved aerated concrete and therefore is at risk of closure. The advice we received from the Department for Education before the summer holiday as that if no internal investigation had taken place recently, a survey should be done as a precaution. We therefore requested DFE surveys in our island voluntary aided schools so that we could be totally confident that everything has been done to keep staff and children safe. Three of the four surveys have already been done, and a fourth is just about to happen. Nothing of concern has been found so far, and the age of the buildings in the fourth school make it extremely unlikely that RAAC is present. The governors of our voluntary aided schools are the people responsible for their school buildings. They take their responsibility seriously and we were therefore keen to take advice from the DFE on this issue to ensure the safety of all involved. It was reported this morning that the RAAC has been found at the Isle of Wight Council owned the Heights Leisure Centre in Sandown. Pembridge Harbour looks set to be put on the open market. From the Island Echo, read by Lee. Benbridge Harbour is to be put up for sale in the very near future. It has been confirmed to the Island Echo. Rumours came to light over the weekend that the harbour was being put on the open market, sparking interest amongst curious locals. Now, owners Malcolm and Fiona Thorpe have revealed that they have indeed made a decision to sell their business connected with the harbour, after 12 years at the helm. It is said that the couple are currently in the process of providing the final pieces of information to their nominated agents or brokers to enable them to take the harbour to the market. In a statement, Mr Thorpe has today, Tuesday, said, Our reasons for the decision to sell are very straightforward. During this month, I have my 75th birthday, and think it is about time a younger generation of management became involved. We want to spend more time with both family and friends. We have missed valuable time with them as a direct consequence of our full-time involvement at the harbour. Fiona and I have, over the past few years, spent an exceptional amount of time managing the business and rejuvenating the harbour, and not least in dealing with the constant legal challenges from BHT all of which have failed conclusively in removing the extremely personal nature of BHT's actions against us. We hope they will be able to find a more productive pathway forward. The harbour is in fine condition and we have just commenced building work at the Dover. The new facilities or offices will be ready for occupation by Easter 2024. Benbridge Boat Storage has better than average space take up for this winter. <clears throat> and by the months of July with its terrible weather, our summer visiting boat numbers have remained consistent with previous years. Our annual berth holder numbers have remained high and rally group numbers have remained equal to recent previous years. 
In the next few days, details of our overall businesses will start to be made available to January in serious inquiries with proof of funding. This is unlikely to be a quick process and in the meantime, with bookings being taken for winter birthing and storage, scheduling for the winter maintenance programme and looking towards 2024 bookings and event dates is very much business as usual. I'm signing off, I really wish I was at least 30 years younger. It is unclear at this stage what exactly will be available for purchase and what the asking price will be. Island Echo recently reported that the Environmental Agency is starting works to strengthen coastal defaults at Benbridge's Embankment Road to prevent the protected nature reserve from being flooded. This is Den reading an article from the Island Echo. Senior Cabinet Member plays down fears over Isle of Wight Council's finances. Fears the Isle of Wight Council could be in dire financial trouble have been calmed by a senior cabinet member. Councillor Jonathan Bacon, the cabinet member in charge of the council's purse strings, said the authority was as confident as it could sensibly be that it can continue to balance its books after a letter was sent out to the media by former cabinet member Councillor Carl Love. Councillor Love feared the Isle of Wight Council was very close to going the same way as Birmingham City Council, the UK's largest local authority, after it effectively declared declared itself bankrupt on Tuesday, the 5th of September. He said he had been warning bankruptcy was on the cards for years, with virtually nothing coming in funds from government to support the island, despite pleads and after years of cuts. Councillor Love said the council needed a significant sum or it is curtains in the not too distant future. While the authority's financial position could not be described as rosy, Councillor Bacon said the council has been given extra resilience after it performed better than expected in the last financial year, making additional savings. Moving forward, Councillor Bacon said, There is already an achievable draft savings programme for next year and they were working to identify and address any potential pressures that might arise due to the difficult national economic climate. He also said the authority hopes to hear news soon about the island deal following the work of leader of the Isle of Wight Council, Councillor Laura P.C. Cox. The latest financial position recently published by the Council, shows the authority is forecasting an overspend of its £1,780.7 million budget by £3.5 million. The Council has £13 million in its general reserves as of the end of June, but it needs to retain at least £7 million before intervention has to be taken. Councillor Love said the council is not keeping up with inflationary pressures, let alone making any kind of advancements, running on the last remaining coppers in the piggy bank. He said, I feel totally frustrated. We cannot provide the best service possible to our residents and we have been forced by this government to cut everything but the bare minimum. Councillor Love left his position earlier in the year as Cabinet Member for Adult Social Care after he found it stressful trying to make the pound stretch the extra mile to cover ever-growing service costs. In this year's budget, adult social care costs account for nearly one-third of the authority's spending and is already predicted to go over over its budget by more than £2.2 million. Hello everyone, this is Steve reading a story from the Island Echo and it's about our very own Sight for White's Open Day, which is backed by popular demand. The island's oldest working charity, Sight for White, will be teaming up with White Sense to welcome islanders who are living with all levels of sight and hearing loss to join them at the first Newport Scouts Hall on 13th of September. The event, last held in March this year, attracted over 110 local people living with both reduced hearing and sight and chatted with 16 other organisations to gain one-to-one help, support and advice. They were given the chance to trial equipment beforehand. The next event on 13th of September 
will offer the same, but with a difference. This time, the theme of the event has been kept very local. Lisa Hollyhead, who's the CEO of Site for White, said, We have reduced the number of equipment suppliers this time significantly, as our aim is to ensure island residents have a chance to meet as many other local charities and organisations who offer help as possible. Each stand has been carefully selected to ensure visitors to the event can speak with as wide a range of services as possible. We are offering a one-stop shop for on-the-spot advice, equipment demonstrations and signposting for support for any islanders living with sight or hearing conditions. The feel of the day will be coffee, cake and one-to-one. No hard sell of expensive items, just genuine people who have dedicated their working lives to helping people. Lisa Hollyhead goes on to say, As someone born legally blind, but also someone who is losing their hearing rapidly, I understand what having both a congenital, lifelong sensory loss is like and what acquired second sense also brings. I understand firsthand how important it is to receive the right help at the right time. So this open day is doing just that. We, as a charity, cannot provide everything, but we can understand you as an individual and point you in the right direction when we cannot help directly. Our aim here at the charity is to help people live safely, independently and confidently. White Sense offer home visits for one-to-one assessments to look at your individual needs, offer equipment loans, mobility training and daily living skills. Everyone is welcome with homemade cakes on offer to everyone. Good morning, this is an article from the Island Echo read by Sue. Renowned author Peter J. Murray launches latest gothic horror book, The Darker Side of White. Carisbrook Castle is reputedly one of the most haunted sites on the Isle of Wight. Therefore, it was entirely appropriate that renowned author Peter J. Murray chose the Castle Museum to launch his latest Gothic horror book, The Darker Side of White. After a welcome and introduction from Peter Harrigan, the publisher at Medina Publishing, based in Cowes, the author proceeded to give a full hour of entertainment. Despite, in his own words, being hopeless at maths at school, he became a teacher. Some of this time at Cheam, where King Charles III was once a pupil for 15 years. His chosen subject being maths. During that period, he was the entertainment officer, which is apparent from his professional performance at school. His nickname was DJ. Think about it. As a child, he often holidayed with his family on the Isle of Wight, or, as he calls it, the Isle of Fright. He enjoys the island so much, in fact, that he is currently living in temporary accommodation on the island, but plans to move here permanently soon with his wife of 50-plus years, Kath. They both often visit island schools for book reading sessions and have taken these same sessions which introduce children to reading around the UK and the world. After outlining his early life and his teaching career, he revealed one of his characters, Moki Joe, the product of his own imagination, started him on his road as he published author, self-published in 2003, Monkey Joe is Coming, became a big seller and he has never looked back. During his performance, King Charles I came to life by means of a brief appearance while another resident of the castle, a bat flew in and did a few laps of the room before disappearing. Amongst the audience, there was a mixture of fright, disbelief and a degree of laughter. How did he do it? Well, he didn't, actually. It was a purely an unscripted moment. Even Peter J was taken aback. As for the book itself, which is aimed at children, but suitable for adults, There are 12 individual stories, all with island connection, with an introduction for each by the author. The Darker Side of White features various characters like John, Jax, Alexander, the alien boy, witch Hazel 
Mary in Carisbrook Castle, A. Lucard, Use a Mirror, and the Siamese Twins at Braiding Wax Museum. You don't need to be an island resident to enjoy this book. Even visitors will recognise some of the locations and relate to spooky lane or shoot adventures. Cover artwork and inner line drawings are by Paul Bryn Davies, who has been commissioned by no less than Stephen King. Graphic design of this hard book cover is by Louise Drew. This book, Just Look Out For The Dark Side Of The Hair, is available from Medina Bookshop Cows and other outlets. Police and Crime Commissioner joins Chief Constable in ceremony for Forces Fallen Police Dogs. From the Isle of Wight Radio, read by Lee. The Police and Crime Commissioner, Donna Jones, and the Chief Constable, Scott Chilton, have paid tribute to the Constabulary's K9 partners by officially unveiling a police dog memorial. The service took place at the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Constabulary's HIOWC training headquarters in Netley on Monday, the 4th of September 2023. PCC Donna Jones said it was an emotional event. Police dogs really are the unsung heroes who never hesitate to put their lives on the line, showing incredible bravery in detecting, chasing down, tackling and apprehending suspects. Today's ceremony was a lovely way of honouring their commitment and to say a huge thank you publicly to all those who have sadly fallen in the line of duty. PC Neil Skinner of Hampshire and the Isle of Wight Constabulary has two police dogs, or PDs, on the memorial and was recognised at the ceremony along with PD Libby for 10 years of service. He said, I'm very proud to have worked with such loyal dogs because they're going to do whatever it takes to protect me and that's a great honour. PCC Donna Jones concluded, Time and time again, police dogs are put in harm's way to protect the public, and I can't think of a better tribute to all of our fallen police dogs than the ceremony we had here today. This is Den, reading an article from Isle of Wight Radio. Yarmouth's Isle of Wight Solar Farm Plan Approved The Isle of Wight's largest solar farm has been approved to provide energy for future generations. Last night, Tuesday, the green light was given to the Barnfield Solar Farm on the outskirts of Yarmouth, which would be able to generate enough green energy to power around 9,300 homes a year. The plans have been met with concerns from nearby residents at the meeting of the Isle of Wight Council's planning committee about negatively impacting the landscape at Wilmingham Lane by putting solar panels on a greenfield site and a lack of community benefit apart from the energy. Councillor Matt Price said the solar farm was a necessary evil and that when the committee turns down green energy producing facilities, they were putting energy at risk for younger generations. He said, the future is not in fossil fuels, it is in renewables. If you ask the younger generation what we should be doing, it is not turning down solar farms. Councillor Jeff Brodie said there would be community benefit in the longer term, moving away from fossil fuel dependency with a self-sufficient energy supply which would be reflected in bills in years to come. There are six other solar farms in the surrounding West White area, all of which have the capacity combined to produce 25 megawatts a year. But the Barnfield project would be able to produce 28 megawatts alone. A representative of Low Carbon UK said the site could be up and running in the next two years and operational for the next 40 years. He answered concerns about the electrical grid capacity on the island, saying the company would not bring forward the site if the capability were not there. He said the island needed the solar farm if it were to meet its net zero goal by 2040 and that it would help deliver 10% of the council's target towards self-sufficiency and renewable energy generation. 
The application was unanimously supported by the committee and the permission will be subject to 21 conditions. This is the second part of the Talking News, read today by me, Morris. And Francis. Excellent town cafe set to close. A popular Cows Town Centre Cafe restaurant has announced it will close for the final time in October. Jolliffe's Eatery took to social media to announce the sad news. The business, which is run by Adam Harbour, said, It's been over three years since I took over this magnificent building and I honestly never knew what it means to so many people. Before we say goodbye, there is still time to drop by and see us before we close the doors. I would like to thank all of our customers for their ongoing support over the past few years. The eatery operates from a historic Grade 2 listed building in Shooters Hill. Following news of its closure, well-wishers flocked to Facebook to praise Jolliffe's for its excellent food and customer service. It will close for final time on October the 1st. Councillors in bid for shot at MP. Two Isle of Wight councillors are in the running to be nominated as the candidate for the Liberal Democrats at the next general election. Councillors Michael Lilly and Nick Stewart announced earlier this week they will be seeking nomination from the Lib Dems as approved candidates to represent the island in its two seats of the East and West White. Councillor Lilly, a former mayor of Ryde, joined the Lib Dems earlier this year, moving across the group on the Isle of Wight Council and will be hoping to stand in the East White seat. Councillor Stewart was the only approved Lib Dem parliamentary candidate on the island between 2019 to 2023 and said he was pleased to see other candidates emerge. The formal civil servant will be looking to stand in the West White Ward. With the two most recent wins in the Isle of Wight Council by-elections, a statement from the pair said the Liberal Democrats have the best chance in a generation to deliver MPs that represent the wider majority of fair-minded islanders. Councillors Lily and Stewart said they want to hear from islanders about their concerns and encourage people to join them for a better future. Group cut off by tide rescued. A group of people were rescued in Freshwater Bay on Wednesday after they found themselves cut off by the tide. Emergency teams were alerted at around 12.45 with the Needles and Ventnor Coast Guard rescue teams arriving on the clifftop. Lifeboats from Yarmouth and Lymington arrived to assist and were on standby in the bay. After assessing the situation, a Coast Guard helicopter was called to the rescue with a crew member seen fast roping down to the beach and picking up individuals. Coast Guard crews were able to safely transport the group to the clifftop where an ambulance was waiting. By-election face-off. Two candidates have thrown their hat in the ring to sit on a town council. Residents in Bonchurch and Ventnor East will go to the polls on Thursday to fill a gap on Ventnor Town Council. It follows the resignation of Brian Lucas, a long-standing member of the town council. Now, James Toogood and Adrian Whitaker are vying for the position. Mr Toogood was previously a member of the Ventnor Town Council representing the West Ward but resigned earlier in the summer saying at the time a bully had made it unbelievably difficult. He is now standing to represent a different ward, Bonchurch and Ventnor East, months after his resignation. Speaking this week, Mr Toogood said he had resigned due to personal pressures, which meant he could not give his best. He said, I soon regretted that decision as I enjoy working with the staff and councillors, mostly in a practical way. Mr Toogood said the opportunity to stand in Ventnor East and Bond Church interested him 
as he has a good working relationship with the outgoing councillor Lucas. He said, the ward offers a new challenge and I look forward to listening to the residents' concerns and wishes. Mr Whitaker is a member of other councils on the south of the island, Lake and Shanklin, and represents the Vectis party. Following the turmoil at Ventnor Town Council, Mr Whitaker says he feels he is the best candidate to bring stability with a proven track record of getting things done and spearheading successful community projects. Around the Bonchurch and Ventnor East Ward, Mr Whitaker said he had noticed serious road defects on Leeson Road, unwalkable paths, overgrown vegetation, missing signs and broken benches. If elected, he said, he would be undertaking a ward survey, road by road, to find out what needs to be done. The polling station will be at St Boniface Church and open from 7am to 10pm. Mr Toogood's former position in the Ventnor West Ward is still available and is now open for co-option. Robin Hill closes shock as staff let go. Dozens of seasonal staff working for the company behind two of the Isle of Wight's biggest attractions have been let go, the county press can reveal. Following news, Robin Hill is to close earlier than usual this year. Vectis Ventures, which runs the country park, is blaming weather and the economy for a challenging summer. It has resulted in 36 employees, all on zero-hour contracts, being given their notice. Retail and catering staff at Black Gang Chine are among those affected. The county press has been told employees, some of whom were returning staff members, have worked for the attractions over previous summers, were shocked and very upset to hear the news. It is thought some workers from Robin Hill will now be based at Black Gang. A spokesperson for Vectis Ventures said, as with previous years, all of those staff would have had a break in their working period between now and October half term as the park quietens down. Historically, Robin Hill has always closed during this period. Therefore, the only real change is that these staff will not be coming back to work the week of the October half term. No permanent staff have been made redundant, Vectis Ventures has confirmed. Alec Dabble, owner of the company, said the season had been a challenging one due to the economy and the weather. The impact of the less than ideal summer is likely to be felt at other outdoor attractions. Will Miles, MD at Visit Isle of Wight, told the county press. Robin Hill is to close this Sunday and will not reopen until December the 20th when its polar events return. The park's fiesta of the dead has been moved to Black Gang. Robin Hill frequent visitor pass holders can use them at Black Gang Chine for the rest of the season and those who have a pass for both sites can get £10 credit added to their pass. Customers must email info at robin-hill.com by October the 23rd. Late night sailings on Yarmouth route. Isle of Wight ferry firm Whitelink has announced it is introducing late night sailings on its Yarmouth to Lymington route from next year. As already reported by the county press, evening crossings on the ride to Portsmouth Fast Cat will also continue. CEO Keith Greenfield has told the CP the services are being operated at times people say they want them. Starting from January the 5th, 2024, there will be later evening sailings between Lymington and Yarmouth at weekends. An extra crew of 10 has been hired, but the 6.20am from Yarmouth has been pushed back to 7am, seven days a week, Whitelink said. The last ferry from Lymington will be the 9.05pm while the final boat from Yarmouth will be 9.50pm on Fridays and Mondays all year round. Mr Greenfield said they, these are the most popular days for people arriving and leaving the island. 
from Monday, March the 25th, when the summer timetable starts, there will be additional later sailings on Saturday and Sunday. On the fast cat route, departures will continue to operate from the mainland at 9.45pm and 10.45pm throughout the year. Late night sailings on the fast cat were reintroduced in March following a public appeal. Whiteling said the reason they weren't brought in earlier was because the demand wasn't there. While Mr Greenfield said the services are not crowded now, he is hopeful we can grow them from this point. Asked whether there was a chance late night sailings could be removed if demand fails, he said, we don't build in a way that we are thinking of taking things off again. He added that there will be no timetable changes to the Portsmouth to Fishbourne route. London Double Deckers Plug Bus Gap Delays mean Southern Vectors' new Isle of Wight buses will not arrive until the end of October. Eagle-eyed Islanders may have spotted red London buses operating on the island over the last few weeks. The buses have been serving the ride to Newport route, among others. The bus firm has said they have been drafted in from its sister company to replace some of its older buses. They are being used until the company's new 1.7 million double-deckers arrive. They were originally due in August and September, but that has now been delayed until late October. Richard Tildesley, the South Southern Vectis General Manager, said, Our new buses will have the latest and cleanest Euro 6 engines as well as an interior spec, offering improved comfort for customers. In the meantime, we hope people enjoy seeing a temporary splash of red on the island's buses. As the county press previously reported, the seven new buses are set to serve the Cows to Newport Route 1 service. The new buses will have USB charging points for smartphones and handheld devices. There will also be a contactless payment option. Operator steps in to save ferry. The future of an historic Solent ferry operator has been secured thanks to Isle of Wight ferry firm Red Funnel. The Highs ferry has been bought by company allowing the service to continue operating between Highs and Southampton. Fran Collins, CEO of Red Funnel, said, We have been operating a lifeline service to the Isle of Wight for over 160 years and are very proud of our heritage in providing connectivity across the Solent. The Highs Ferry is also a route of historical significance providing essential services to Solent users and we are pleased to be able to support its future. Red Funnel first began its ferry service in 1861 and during its long history, the Isle of Wight ferry operator has hosted millions of passengers from islanders and commuters to families exploring the Isle of Wight to celebrities and royals. Blue Funnel Ferries has operated the highest ferry service since 2017. Lee Raymond, CEO of Blue Funnel Ferries, added, through Red Funnel's purchase, the highest ferry will continue to serve highs and the Solent community. The highest ferry offers daily sailings between highs and Southampton Town Quay, sailing from the end of highs historic pier. The Hythe Ferry will retain its blue funnel livery for the foreseeable future. Boathouse Fundraiser Beats Target Newport Rowing Club, the NRC, closed its crowdfunder last week, having reached and exceeded its target for clubhouse repairs. The club had hoped to raise £8,000 to undertake necessary works to keep the clubhouse standing for another generation. The building is understood to be one of only two boathouses built above tidal waters in the UK. High tides and winds have weakened the building, which now needs steel underpinning to keep it secure. Further to this, funds are needed to repair the slipway, which is rotting. 
The campaign, including a contribution of £2,400 from Sport England, has raised £9,500. Club chair Julie Clark said, We have been truly humbled by the support and encouraging messages. It really means a lot to us. Knowing the funds were coming, the club started repairs to the slipway last week and steel underpinning works are set to begin this week. The extra money raised will allow the refurbishment of the upstairs section and if there is enough left over, the club hopes to repaint the north side of the roof with the iconic NRC motif. Once the building is in good shape, the club pans, plans to host an open day to show it off. Advice to visitors as hospital work starts. Vehicle movements at St Mary's Hospital have been restricted after the next phase of works to upgrade the start started on Monday. The entrance to the Children's Emergency Department is being improved to allow better access for ambulances. As a new ambulance entrance is being built, it means drivers will not be able to use the hospital site as a through route. Access to the main car park will be maintained coming from Parkhurst Road. Those wanting to park in the North Car Park near the Maternity Department should also use the main entrance on Parkhurst Road. Everyone else will need to use the entrance on Dodna Lane at the back of the hospital, the Isle of Wight NHS Trust said. This work is scheduled to take five weeks and the diversion will remain in place for this period. A spokesperson for the Isle of Wight NHS Trust said, We apologise for any inconvenience, but these temporary restrictions are necessary to ensure the safety of staff, patients and contractors. While we know building work can be disruptive for patients and visitors, we will always work to ensure this is kept to a minimum. Bus stopgap answer to NHS dental crisis. A mobile dental bus could be coming to start solving the island's worsening dentistry crisis. It comes as a patient watchdog has been told of almost impossible searches to find an NHS practice taking new patients on the island and one person pulling out their own teeth in desperation. Revealed by health bosses on Monday, the strategy would have three prongs of attack. A dental bus creating a centre of dental development and fair pay across dental contracts. Simon Cooper, the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Integrated Care Board, Director of Pharmacy, Optometry and Dentistry, told the Isle of Wight Council's Health and Social Care Scrutiny Committee he hoped the strategy would stop the situation getting worse. Mr Cooper said improvements could start within a year through the dental bus or if more dentists were to come forward, although significant leaps could take four or five years. The bus would come to the island for weeks at a time providing access to a dentist for those who cannot see an NHS one. Other improvements could see a centre of dental development started on the island, working with Portsmouth Dental Academy, training, training islanders as dentists and healthcare professionals and retaining them here in the future, although it may take two or three years to get it started, Mr Cooper said. Another was to make pay fairer across the island for dentists. As Mr Cooper said, some dentists were being paid different amounts but doing the same work. The strategy was dubbed by Healthwatch Isle of Wight as really positive and hope on the horizon at last. Manager of the patient watchdog, Joanna Smith, said for the past five years they have not been able to help people who have come to them begging for help to access a dentist. Miss Smith said the situation on the island was worse compared to the mainland and going to worsen 
as people are now struggling to not only see a dentist, but access urgent or emergency dental care in a never-ending cycle. The strategy will go before the ICB executive in the coming months for approval, with an update to be given to the Health Committee's meeting in December. Arson Arrest Officers investigating an arson series in East Cowes arrested a man last Friday, September the 1st. The incidents occurred between June the 16th and July the 14th of this year, with almost a dozen vehicles suspected of being deliberately set alight in the York Avenue, Mayfield Road, Victoria Grove and Kent Avenue areas. In the most recent incident, a fire occurred at a house in Princess Close. The total estimated cost of the damage for all of the incidents combined is around three hundred and fifty to four hundred thousand pounds. The North East White Neighbourhoods Policing Team, with support from CID, have been following up all available lines of inquiry into these incidents, and a fifty-six year old man from East Cowes was arrested on suspicion of arson. The boss of Isle of Wight ferry firm Whitelink has told the county press the operator is considering a fixed fare for NHS customers and has hit back at claims the company puts price before people. In an exclusive interview with the CP, Keith Greenfield revealed Whitelink is open to bringing in a set price for those travelling for hospital trips, but he said it is about striking the right balance. Although the Cross Solent operator currently gives NHS customers 50% off for NHS patients, there are concerns about the cost of tickets inflating at busy periods. For example, in the holidays, patients are finding prices are high, even after applying the half-price discount. Mr Greenfield said a fixed rate is something being discussed for the 10,000 NHS customers who travel with Whitelink. He said we need to make sure we don't disadvantage those generally travelling at less than the rate most customers are travelling at. We're open to doing that but it has got winners and losers in it and we don't want to disappoint customers who maybe are already achieving a better fare than has been suggested. The CP received over 400 responses to a Facebook post asking you what you would like to ask the ferry boss. Many of the questions centred around the cost of travel and why prices were so high, especially for islanders. Mr Greenfield said moving 4 million people a year across the Solent and maintaining ports and the ships is not a cheap business. One reader pointed out it was cheaper to catch a ferry in Scotland to which he said services there are unreliable and the ferries are not in good condition. He said much like rail services, if islanders book early, prices are generally cheaper. Pressed on whether prices would return to pre-Covid levels, he said that would not happen, but he would try to keep them on the right side of inflation. On, a offering, on offering a fixed rate for islanders, he said, we're in a competitive market. We choose how to offer discounts in different ways compared to our competitors. Readers raised, raised concerns about one of those schemes, the Multilink Pass. Some holders say they are finding it difficult to book ferries due to slots being unavailable online, but when they get on the ferry it is often not very busy. Mr Greenfield said in order to keep Multilink costs lower, Whitelink needs to protect space on its vessels for full price traffic. Asked whether this was an example of Whitelink prioritising customers paying more, he said there's no prioritisation based on how much fare you pay. We can offer multi-link by restricting capacity to 15% on all sailings. On the possibility of a public service obligation being introduced to ensure standards are up to a certain level, Mr Greenfield said he would have to see what it entailed, but he questions what might be achieved by it. He also said sinking boat and train arrivals is probably as good as it can be but the firm will continue to work to improve connections. One person's good connection is somebody else's poor connection, so we have to try and balance it, he said. He added Whitelink is introducing late night sailings to its Limington to Yarmouth route from next year, as per requests from customers. As the county press previously reported, they will also continue on the ride to Portsmouth Fast Cat service. 
Boy bailed after armed police response. A 16-year-old boy was arrested following an armed police response in his cows on Bank Holiday Monday. Hampshire and Isle of Wight constabulary officers descended on York Avenue at 5.50pm. They were called to reports of the concern for the welfare of a boy at an address on the road. Officers with riot shields attended and various weapons, including a knife and an air gun, were seen. Specialist officers were deployed to ensure the safety of the boy. Officers and members of the public, police said. A 16-year-old boy from the town was subsequently arrested on suspicion of threats to kill. He has since been bailed with conditions until November the 28th. The incident saw the bottom of York Avenue closed to the public and vehicles were unable to access the Red Funnel Terminal for a time. Businesses and residents were caught up in the cordon and the cooperative was cleared by officers and closed. Mainland police with extra skills were drafted in and a police dog was also on scene. Southern Water can't say how many dry spills on the Isle of Wight. Southern Water is one of three major water companies that discharged sewage hundreds of times last year on days when it was not raining. The practice known as dry spilling is banned because it can lead to higher concentrations of sewage in waterways. Southern Water, along with Thames and Wessex, appear to have collectively released sewage in dry spills for 3,500 hours in 2022, in breach of their permits, according to BBC News. Without rainwater, the sewage is likely to be less diluted, leading to build-ups of algae which produce toxins, Dr Linda May, a water ecologist at the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, said. It can be fatal to pets and pose a health risk to swimmers. Southern Water was unable to supply details of the number of dry spillages on the island, but John Pennicud, head of Wastewater, said, So-called dry spills are a complex issue. Water is a powerful force of nature, and high groundwater conditions can lead to rising water finding the path of least resistance into a network of sewer pipes and manholes. A discharge made up of groundwater is not caused by rainfall and can happen in dry weather. It is required to be reported as a spill. The problem is especially challenging in areas prone to flooding as mitigation measures such as sewer relining and manhole sealing redirects flows and groundwater can then cause flooding. Private illegal connections to the system are another potential source. We work with the Environment Agency and stakeholders to cut these so-called dry spills and all forms of water and wastewater releases. Homes plan near school is rejected. Plans to build houses near a rural primary school have been refused for fears the development would eat into the countryside. Local farmers, A.E. Browns, was seeking permission to build three properties on one of its greenfields in Areton, next door to Areton Primary School. The plans were for three, two three-bed houses and one two-bed bungalow, which planning agents on behalf of the applicant, BCM, said were suitable for the modest site and designed to fit in with the area at the bottom of Areton Downs. The Isle of Wight Council disagreed and rejected the plans earlier this month on the grounds the homes would have an adverse impact on the character and appearance of the area due to their size, location and position. In its decision notice, the planning authority said the proposed dwellings would fail to protect and preserve the visual amenity of the plot or the wider rural nature and would appear detached and out of character with the existing pattern of development. Officers said the land is seen as countryside 
and contributes significantly to the area's pleasant rural character and appearance, not as being surrounded by development. The notice also said extending the built form onto undeveloped agricultural land would result in a detrimental and incongruous development, eroding a pleasant and open green space, which has a sense of tranquility and rural seclusion. The proposals were not popular with some members of the community, with 11 objections received, including from Arreton Parish Council and the Area of Outstanding Natural Beauty Partnership. Among reasons the Parish Council objected included flooding risks, it would be out of scale, and the housing wouldn't meet meet the needs of the village as there are other developments already approved. The AONB partnership said the development would appear to encroach into undeveloped countryside and works to school lane proposed, including resurfacing and widening it, would have significant urbanising impacts to the narrow, narrow rural lane. Other concerns raised by residents include highway safety concerns, ecological impacts and a lack of archaeological survey as the site lies close to the core medieval settlement of Areton. And now we move on to white memories and nostalgia and this is a headline that reads I saw him take the pistol out and shoot me by Ian Crump. <coughs> It was a card that led to a hotelier clinging to life and a first-class officer facing ruin. Dropped through the letterbox of a retired army sergeant's home, the mail contained a family portrait of a long-standing colleague. The facial features troubled James King. He thought there was an uncanny likeness to one of his children. Had his wife Annie been unfaithful and had a child with Charles Bradley? She and Charles denied it at first but later confirmed James's fears. It culminated in what the March 20, 1909 edition of the County Press dubbed the Ride Sensation, with the two men appearing in the dock at Hampshire Assizes in consecutive trials. King was charged with sending a letter threatening to kill Bradley, a sergeant major in the 12th Howitzer Brigade of the Royal Field Artillery. In turn, Bradley was accused of attempting to murder James's wife at Ride Crown Hotel. Jurors in 1909 heard that Bradley's and the King's had been firm friends, the two men having served together at Deep Cut Barracks in Surrey. Shattered at the discovery, King fired off a series of letters in a drunken stupor, accusing Bradley in one of, uh, in one of being a coward and a dirty dog, not one spark of manhood. He insisted to, de to detectives he would never have resorted to violence. I had some recollection of writing some letters to Bradley, but I was too broken-hearted to remember what was in them. I had no intent of carrying it out. I only wanted to expose him. Bradley's brother Ernest told the court he went to the, to the island to determine the truth and told King he did not think he realised the implications of what he had done. He asked him to apologise by either withdrawing the insinuations or signing a document to the effect he was innocent, with the warning his brother was roaming about with a loaded pistol. King refused, telling him, I would rather lose my right hand. Jurors took just five minutes to acquit him uh, before Bradley took his place in the dock. The court was told after King refused to sign the disclaimer, Bradley's brother went to the police and obtained a warrant seeking his arrest. An hour later, King surrendered himself to the police and as a result, PC Futural went to the Crown Hotel to deliver a message to Annie King from her husband. She was about to switch on the sitting room light when Bradley, who had been drinking with his brother before they inexplicably became separated, suddenly walked in and immediately shot her in front of the officer shouting, She has been advertising me for the last fortnight and I will now advertise the Crown Hotel. Mrs King, who was allowed to give her evidence in a chair because of her poor health, 
confirmed the card had instigated unpleasantness between her and her husband and how Bradley had suddenly produced the revolver. I saw him take the pistol out of his pocket and shoot me. I fell on the ground. Futrell said on being shot, Mrs King threw up her arms and fell. He carried her out of the room and told the officer, Stop, that's enough. Mr Bradley, I detained him and he continued to mutter, exclaiming, Oh God, whatever made me do it? I had no intention of doing when I came to ride this morning. In evidence, Bradley said he only carried the revolver for self-protection because King had been threatening to shoot him. He called on Mrs King to deliver a letter from his wife and when he opened the door he saw her with her hand on the light switch. I also saw the constable and in my upset state I connected the presence of the constable with that of King and as I had been on guard against him for several days, I had the pistol in my left-hand pocket. I unbuttoned my coat and took out the pistol to put it into my right-hand side pocket and was changing my stick to my other hand when, to my horror, the pistol went off. Asked by Mr Justice Bucknell if he had deliberately fired at Mrs King or if he had intended to do so, he emphatically stated, No, I did not. The note I wanted to get from her was refutation of the charges made against me. They were untrue. Captain Douglas Stewart of the RFA told jurors of Bradley's exemplary record and achievements. He has attained the highest rank possible as a non-commissioned officer. He has the highest possible character a soldier could have. In his closing speech to the jury, defence barrister Mr Emmanuel submitted the prosecution had failed to prove a motive why he had harboured any ill feeling towards her. But the judge contradicted him, stressing his evidence was not consistent with the theory of an accident. Directing the jury as to the law, he stated, If you believe the pistol went off accidentally, you must acquit him. The question is, did he intend to shoot her? When the jury returned a verdict of guilty, Bradley immediately begged, <clears throat> I plead for mercy. The judge lamented, it was one of the most painful cases over which he had presided. The evidence fully warranted the verdict for an act which perhaps was committed in an overwhelming passion. The sentence I must pass is not just a punishment against you, but might act as a deterrent to others, and that sentence must be severe, he said. Bradley was handed ten years penal servitude. Now we're moving on to my view. And this is Reflections on Island Life, written by Sarah Redrup, who is the new Lib Dem councillor for Wootton Bridge. Earlier this year, I was sat putting the world to rights with councillor Michael Lilly, who represents Ride, Apley and Elmfield. He had come to Grace's Bakery to discuss local projects that we might be interested in being involved in. Soon the conversation veered off into discussing the problems of housing, dentistry and the cost of living crisis. To my surprise, Councillor Lilly asked me if I had ever thought of standing in an election. Up until that moment, I probably would have said definitely not. But he got me thinking, why shouldn't I give it a go? I think we're so used to seeing professional politicians on TV that we often feel disconnected from our democracy. Sometimes it feels like it is something that is done around us and not something we're all doing together. I wanted to stand because I wanted to take part in the process. I felt tired of being frustrated on the sidelines. I chose to stand for the Liberal Democrats because they share my passion for empowering the individual to make their voice heard. Our representatives are supposed to be a representative of us all. But when I looked at the council, I felt there was a gap. 
Nationally, the average age of councillors is 60 years old, with the under 45s representing only 16%. On our council, just 9 out of the 39 of us are women. Everyone has different life experiences. We don't all see things in the same way. So when we're problem solving and making plans for our island's future, we need a variety of perspectives in the room if we want the best outcomes. I would love to see more younger people engaged with our local democracy. I remember being 16 years old and enthralled by the referendum to change our voting system. I spent ages researching different ways of electing representatives and wished I was just a little bit older. I remember feeling at the time that change was possible and we didn't have to put up with the same old politics if we didn't want to. I still believe that now. You can be the change you want to see in the world. I've been in post for almost two weeks now and much of that time I've spent introducing myself to people, listening and learning. I put myself forward in the election being completely honest with people on the doorstep. I don't have all the answers and I won't pretend to know everything. But what I can offer is that I'm open to listening. I think it's incredibly important to learn from the people you represent, to take their voices and amplify them. It can seem a bit scary to put yourself out there and knock on people's doors. But from my experience in Wooten, people are friendly and happy to chat. One wonderful woman even rushed out and handed me a cold can of coke on a hot day. I met a lot of different people with fascinating backgrounds and life stories. I met one lovely gentleman who spent his younger years working in bakeries around London, just like my dad, and a woman who told me stories of campaigning for the Liberal Party before they merged with the Social Democrats in the 80s. In May 2025, all 39 council seats will be up for election. It's your chance to be the change you want to see. If you feel you have the time, compassion and energy to serve your community, then what are you waiting for? Opinion by Imogen Chu Los Locals get priced out of the market. Last month, a friend and I were driving to her house in Yarmouth. As we neared, she warned me that we were about to face, in her words, parking Armageddon. She wasn't wrong. There are six or seven streets in Yarmouth where the residents who are able to buy a Y1 permit can park for as long as they want. It's a good deal if you can find a spot. We drove round each tiny back street of the town. Eventually, we, were lu we lucked out, but it was still a five-minute walk from her place. She told, told me we had scored the jackpot. Usually, getting a space at this time of day was nearly impossible. How do you do this every day? I asked her. Oh, I don't, she replied. It's only in the summer. The rest of the time, there are plenty of spaces. And there's the crux of the issue. My friend estimates that between two thirds and three quarters of the houses on her street are second homes or holiday lets. Yarmouth feels the issue more keenly than other towns, but it's a problem across the island. According to Hamptons, the estate agents, about 7% of the properties bought last year on the island were second homes. This is way above the average for the southeast, 1.5%, and higher than other holiday hotspots like Pembrokeshire and Brighton and Hove. Other areas are making a stand. Last year, residents in Whitby, North Yorkshire, voted to ban any new build being sold as a second home or holiday let. Councils in Wales can now cap the number of second homes in their areas. The island should be making similar moves. Second homes push up the cost of housing for locals. More demand equals higher prices, especially if the extra demand is coming from investors who are able to buy quickly and in cash. As it stands, the average property price is £375,358. 
the average salary at 31,000 is less than a tenth of this. You will have also noticed the staff wanted signs in almost every restaurant, cafe and shop. A lack of residents in some areas will have exacerbated the recruitment crisis. Perhaps controversially for an islander, I also want to see new homes being built. I want to see new houses for doctors and nurses, families looking to make the island their home. But there seems little point if a significant chunk of any new development will be bought as a holiday let. It would be naive to imagine a world where the Isle of Wight doesn't need tourists and I'm certainly not suggesting that we get rid of holiday lets and second homes completely. There is a balance to be struck and a difficult line to tread. I don't envy policy makers. All I do know is that we're not currently getting it right. If all the locals are priced out, what will the tourists be visiting? And now this is public information and an article written by Superintendent Rob Mitchell, Hampshire and Isle of Wight Constabulary. As anticipated, it has been a very busy summer for our Isle of Wight policing teams. Alongside daily policing activity, teams have supported the safe running of major events such as the Isle of Wight Festival, the internationally famous Cows Week and the increased demands on services from many other summer events including last, week's, uh, last weekend's scooter rally. In addition to the beautiful countryside and coastline, it's no wonder the island continues to be a very popular summer destination for tens of thousands of visitors. Since our new Chief Constable arrived, we continued to see, our, to see changes to our operating model that has been designed to allow us to focus more keenly on three key priorities. Excellent local policing, a relentless pursuit of criminals and improved victim care. Whilst these structural changes are taking place across the whole force, Island teams continue to deal with day-to-day -day calls for assistance and we utilise mainland specialist resources such as the proactive roads policing units who regularly support our local team identifying and dealing with dangerous road users. On the island, local policing teams have seen some redesign to reflect the new model. Our district policing teams have been carrying out more crime investigations on top of their response and patrol responsibilities and our neighbourhood police teams, the NPT, are now supported by newly formed area-wide neighbourhood support teams. This will allow greater targeted focus on crime hotspots within communities that neighbourhood officers need support with. NPT is reshaping to ensure that every neighbourhood will have a named neighbourhood police officer responsible for problem solving and engaging with their communities. Every officer will have responsibility for investigating crime, not just the investigation department, so that every crime with reasonable lines of inquiry gets that attention. There will always be tough decisions to make, ensuring the right resources go into the serious crimes that pose serious harm, However, we can do more under the new model to ensure lower level crimes get the attention required to ensure communities feel safer. We're already seeing success in targeting our most persistent and aggravating shoplifters on the island. These offences have seen staff threatened and ordinary shoppers put in fear. Some of this offending stems from alcohol and drug addiction, so in addition to arrest and sending to court, we're working with courts and part partner agencies to help offenders find support to stop offending. It's so important that residents and businesses keep reporting information to us about those who are causing harm. This helps us build an accurate picture of the issues affecting local people. What's on? Pianist's welcome return. Internationally acclaimed pianist Viv McLean will be making a welcome return to Freshwater Memorial Hall when he gives the first concert of West White Arts Association's 2023-2024 season. Viv has delighted Isle of Wight audiences in recent years, both for WWAA and the Isle of Wight Symphony Orchestra. 
He has previously been described in the press as having extraordinary originality, superb simplicity, and fingers of steel hidden behind muscles of velvet. Vivor plays sonatas by Scarlatti, Beethoven's Appassionati sonnets, Intermezzo Op 117 by Prams, Movements Perpetuals by Poulenc, and finish with a nocturne, a mazurka, and a scherzo by Chopin. The concert is on Saturday, September the 16th at 7 p.m. Tickets are available from www.westwhitearts.co.uk and Tottenham Parish Office on 756028. Season tickets for all nine concerts are available from Jackie Warner on jackswarner at btnternet.com or 755-825. The Isle of Wight Jazz Weekend is back with something for everyone and performances at venues across Newport. Here's your guide to the Isle of Wight Jazz Weekend 2023, when they're on and how to get tickets from September the 14th and 17th. Thursday, September the 14th at 2pm, Jim Thorne Trio at 1 Holyrood, Holyrood Street, and that is free. Friday, September the 15th at 12pm, Duke Box Jazz Man at Town Centre Choice Cafe in Town Lane, also free. 6pm, Steve Parks Trio and guests at 1 Holyrood, free entry. 8pm, an 8-piece Afrobeat Funk Bank Fellowship of Groove at the Bargeman's Rest in Newport. Saturday, September the 16th at 1pm, Steve Parks on piano at 1 Holyrood. At 8pm, jam session hosted by John Thorne Trio at the Bargeman's Rest. On Sunday, September the 17th at 11.30, Nick Page Trio at Key Arts, and that's £8 in advance and £9 on the door. At 1pm, Tom Hendy on piano at Key Arts Cafe, and that is free. 2pm, JC and Angelina perform vintage jazz, blues, folk at Cafe Asola. That's also free. New art exhibition comes to library. Following on from a successful event earlier this year, Solent Art Painters are holding a second exhibition. The newly formed art group, fresh from their exhibition at Core Abbey, are showcasing their work at Ride Library this month. They have filled the upstairs gallery with paintings in various styles and mediums. They each have their own unique style but share a common interest in Isle of Wight landscapes. Outdoors, Elise Barnard paints with watercolours several times a week and is particularly inspired by light on the sea. Carol Way is an enthusiastic painter of flowers and Simone Mason has painted extensively in watercolours, oil and ink. Marielle Boyd paints in oils and watercolours and her exhibition offerings will include paintings from her extensive travels. For the first time, emerging artist Mike Harvey will be exhibiting his landscapes of the island. The exhibition is open from 9am until 5.30pm on Mondays, Tuesdays and Fridays, 10.30am to 7pm Wednesdays and 9am to 5pm Saturdays. And now we're moving on to letters. And this is a letter from Linda Redfern of Wooten. How did I miss the massive sign outside the toilets opposite the pier in Sandown? I walked in to be confronted by two men using the first two cubicles with the doors wide open. I had to think for a moment, did I walk into the men's by mistake? I know I'm a bit long in the tooth, but I still felt very uneasy and uncomfortable. I won't go into the state of the lose. The only decent cubicle didn't even lock. I felt bad for our visitors on such a lovely beach day. Why did I then feel compelled to hang around when a young girl walked in in her swimwear? Surely it shouldn't be that way. 
Many families use the toilets to change into swimwear. I would be interested how men feel about sharing loos. Utilities under pressure. I wish to say how much I agree with both Sue Preston and T Trevor Humphreys, Island Soapbox, August the 25th and September the 1st, in that there are too many people in the world and this is probably a major cause of global warming. The demand on utility services, the NHS, sewage systems and the ability to produce enough food and provide water all come back to the same problem, too many people. Politicians need to stop treating the symptoms and have the courage to treat the cause instead. Mike Thomas Lake Who's in the money, writes C. Harris of Ventnor. Dear Editor, so there we have it. Grant Shapps, the man who made a fortune selling get-rich-quick schemes under, under a variety of false names on the internet, has been given the role of Defence Secretary by ex-Goldman Sachs partner Rishi Sunak, our Prime Minister, is proving himself fashionably slow when it comes to ensuring all the millions stolen during Covid by his VIP Tory chums is recovered. Worried? I mean, what could possibly go wrong? I tell you what, here's an official PR photograph complete with Union Jack centre stage to allay any fears you might have. Oh, and the cheesy grins? And no, we are not both humming, we're in the money. Village Green, Jonathan Bacon, Chairman of St Helens Parish Council. In reply to Mr Wise complaining about areas of St Helens Green being left uncut, the, view expressed, the views expressed online are strongly in favour of rewilding, but it is appropriate to set out the facts and thinking going on. The Green is the second largest village green in the country, covering 17 acres. It is common land and includes not just the obvious areas, such as the football and cricket pitches, but other parts of the village, including the wooded area to the west, known as the Horseshoe Trail. The management rests with the Isle of Wight Council, but the Parish Council undertakes much of the day-to-day -day curation, including the grass cutting. As common land, there are legal restrictions on what can be done and what it can be used for. Prompted by the Platinum Jubilee Green Canopy Initiative in 2022, a survey took place to consider how management could be taken forward. One of the questions generated a response 80% in favour of a wildflower areas. As such, the Parish Council decided to pursue this. This year has been a testbed as to where and how we might rewild limited areas, conscious of the need to maintain the ability for all to access and enjoy the green. We need a formal management plan, so a group has been formed. A new contract for grass cutting will be tendered for soon. We will also be undertaking formal scientific surveys. The benefits to nature and biodiversity of a managed process of rewilding seem clear and recognised by the majority. However, the group will gather views and create a plan to nurture the green and maintain its importance for now and for future generations. Big birds of a feather flock together, writes Crawford Ivin of St Helens. Dear Editor, in reply to Mr Whiting's letter about flocks of unwelcome birds at the island soapbox on September the 1st, hallelujah, at last someone else feels the same way I do. This island is rapidly becoming overrun with the wrong sort of bird life. The breeding of crows, jackdaws, magpies, rooks and the blue jays has gone unchecked for far too long and now smaller bird species are suffering seriously. If something isn't done very, very soon by the RSPB or the Isle of Wight Council, our smaller native birds will disappear, never to return. Where I live in St Helens, we are plagued with crows and blue jays. Both my neighbours have had them in their loft and they're very difficult to get rid of. 
Put a feeder out for the little feathered friends and more often than not it's attacked by bigger birds and the little ones never get a look in. Then there's the mess they make and the noise at dawn both in summer and winter. And what about the bird brains who feed them? They'll be first to complain when all the sparrows etc have been wiped out but by then it will be too late. Something must be done now. Priorities all wrong from P. Griffiths, Ride. Dear Editor, with the attainment gap in education widening once again, starkly revealing the systemic inequalities between regions, classes and ethnic groups, the sight of hundreds of schools at risk of physical collapse would seem to provide the perfect metaphor for 13 years of Tory neglect and underinvestment in our public services. It is also a salutary reminder of the dangers of short-term political outlook, concerned primarily with the election cycle. Lack of vision and the absence of joined-up thinking. This complacency is especially striking in education, where teachers have seen a 13% real-term pay cut and investment per pupil is significantly lower than it was in 2010. Despite the Department for Education being aware for some years of school sites so dilapidated that they pose a risk to life, schools have suffered a 41% drop in spending on rebuilding since Rishi Sunak became Chancellor in 2020. Similarly, Sunak would provide only £1.4 billion for the pupils' pandemic catch-up programme when Kevin Collins, the government's educational recovery czar, recommended £15 billion. Failure to invest, he argued, could end up costing £160 billion in the long run in welfare and criminal justice, not to mention the human cost of opportunities missed and potential unachieved. Meanwhile, Sunak spent £84 million of public money on self-promotion in the form of his Eat Out to Help Out vanity project, with the unfortunate side effect of igniting the second Covid wave. How's that for thinking ahead? Bernard Hansford of Cows writes new ideas about dangerous dogs. Dear Editor, dangerous dogs, there is now a knee-jerk reaction for the government to reintroduce the dog licence. This was cancelled almost 40 years ago because it costs more to administer than the money collected for the taxman. The government won't do anything. Of course, they can't risk losing a million dog owner votes. However, I have a much better idea which I think would be accepted by 90% of dog owners. I did suggest it to John Major when the government was first trying to deal with the dangerous dog crisis. All the government needs to do is make a law for all dogs to have third party insurance. Here are some of the real benefits this would provide, which a licence does not. 1. Anybody bitten by a dog would be able to claim damages which would actually be paid. Awards ordered by judges are seldom paid. 2. Hospitals would also be able to claim for treatment and be paid. 3. In the worst cases, funerals would be paid for. Insurance companies would bear the cost of administering this plan. They would obviously set different premiums, so the OAP with a poodle would be a small risk and only pay a few pounds a year compared with a man with a Rottweiler. I think the insurance companies should pay the government a levy of £203 per dog, which the government should pass on to councils throughout the country to help pay for poo bins and the emptying thereof. As for enforcement of this new law is concerned, I think the vast majority of dog owners would see it as fair and reasonable and will not object. For the minority who do not insure a dangerous dog, the dog should be put down. Cast your vote carefully from B. Riley of Ride. Dear Editor, Levelling up Secretary Michael Gove has announced he is scrapping the laws 
that make developers limit the harmful chemicals that go into our rivers and seas, the nutrient neutrality rules. The justification is that he wants an extra 100,000 homes built in the next seven years. The government's own figures, which are certainly an underestimate, show that from January 2018 until the end of 2022, more than 135,000 people entered the UK illegally, more than 95% of them claiming asylum and are therefore entitled to free housing. They're also given a weekly allowance, free education, medical and dental treatment, eye tests and glasses. But that's another story. So our precious environment is to be trashed yet again by the Tories because they have failed to take control of our borders. Remind me, what was Brexit all about? The supine Seely, with his history of failing to protect our seas, will doubtless vote exactly as he is told to. Britain today is just a depressing basket case. If I were younger, I would be looking at the alternatives. Fellow islanders, please cast your vote very carefully next time. Sadness and dismay at closure. Chris Allen, Karen Marsh, Joyce Milford, Jane Mills, Sally Stevens, Emily Tilling, all members of the original steering group of the Island Women's Refuge and some of the workers. We write to express sadness and dismay at the news that White Dash Charity, formerly Island Women's Refuge, will cease operations permanently this September after almost exactly 38 years of service, first registered as a charity in October 1985, to women and their children suffering domestic abuse. The basic funding stream that enabled the service was housing benefit claimed for the families who had been rendered homeless. Other generous support came from grants, legacies and donations. We represent members of the original steering group of the IWR organisation, trustees and workers. One of the reasons that the Charity Commission quotes for closure of a charity is that the original purpose has been met or is no longer relevant. Tragically, for many, that is absolutely not the case. The figures often quoted, one in four women will suffer domestic abuse in their lifetime, Home Office in 2019, and two women are domestic violence homicide victims every month in the UK, Femicide Census 2020 persist. Added to this in recent times is social media misogyny that was not even envisaged when the service was originally set up and the constant threat experienced by many through the Covid lockdown periods. The crime survey for England and Wales conducted for the Office of National Statistics was suspended in its work for more than 18 months in this period. What is so often a hidden crime was further buried in a national emergency. Despite welcome legislative changes, sadly abusers are not deterred and nationally we are seeing an increase in the numbers of young women under the age of 24 being victims of intimate partner violence. New legislation sees domestic abuse against women and girls as a national threat akin to terrorism or organised crime and abusers should be held to account by new measures. We know Utrust runs a service through Paragon on the island to offer support and refuge and as assets are usually transferred from a charity that is closing, we trust that the refuge building secured through a housing corporation grant sought by IWR staff and realised through partnership with Housing Association is either still in use or can serve some useful purposes, purpose as a legacy. We understand that services, perceptions and campaigns are always subject to change and development, but it is tragic for a charity to close with so much work still to be done and deeply upsetting for its founder members. We note sadly the Women on White Centre is also closing and so it seems the future has become altogether bleaker for women on the island. This was not the future that the founders of the IWR set out to achieve and we hope and trust the island community remembers its responsibility of protection to all its residents. 
The undersigned wish to acknowledge all the women who played a significant part in setting up IWR and in making what was a distant hope into a reality. The undersigned also apologise to all the women whom we have not been able to contact and hope this non-exhaustive list of names will prompt others to express their views. Concerns from Jeff Hewison Lake A copy of this letter has been sent to Lake Parish Council. I went to use the men's toilets at New Road in Lake and found a sign on the door saying to use the women's toilets as they are now unisex toilets. My concerns are that if my niece goes to use the toilets, she is 12, and there is a pervert in there and something happens. This is in no way acceptable and to be honest I would rather the toilets either be fully closed or you open up the men's again. I think as a parent and as an uncle my concerns are in the right place and I suggest the men's toilets are opened as soon as possible. Many parents across the island will agree with me. And so we've come to the end of this week's Talking News and so it's goodbye from me, Maurice. And goodbye from me, Francis. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. It's a sound to melt the heart of all dog lovers. Around 80 dogs preparing for the training, which will hopefully turn them into successful guide partners for visually impaired people. The training of guide dogs has been taking place in the UK for almost 100 years. But here at Guide Dog Centre North West in Greater Manchester, these dogs are learning using a method only adopted by the organisation in 2017. It's known as the STEP method, standing for Standardised Training for Excellent Partnerships. And it's based on the concept of positive reinforcement, reward rather than reprimand. The organisation believes it produces more confident and engaged dogs and faster training and in a more humane way. Not everyone agrees, including some guide dog owners, and they blame it for long waiting lists for dogs and doubt that it's really effective. So who's right? Well, we've come to Atherton, the training centre here, to watch the step method at work and look for some answers. I've come to what's known as the arena and it's an indoor training area and this is where the dogs start their learning process. Claire and Emma who are on the training staff are just going to explain to me what's going on in front of us. We train our dogs to walk towards a sort of rectangular shape platform. Platforms can be used for many things. So one of the things is distraction training. Um, So where we're stood now in the Atherton Arena, we've got lots of potential distractions around. We've got barking dogs in the background. We've got toys around. We've actually got some sticks around as well that I've just found. Are you also trying to get the dogs to ignore each other as well? Absolutely. So um, the demonstration that we've just given is two guide dogs walking next to each other platform to platform they're about two meters away from each other they were walking platform to platform with their heads looking straight ahead so actually there was minimal input needed from the handler from the trainer from the guide dog owner to get them to walk past another dog whereas historically you would know another dog was there because your dog would lunge towards it and then you would have to use your lead corrections to sort of keep them straight so the way that we do things now is we actually train them the behavior that we want by using the platforms rather than using that positive punishment to show them what's wrong we're showing them what's right instead we're hearing that clicking noise so explain what that's supposed to do and what happens after they hear the clicking noise 
Sure, so essentially a clicker is a marker to the dog that says, yes, you've got that right, reward is coming. So for some dogs that's praise, for some dogs that's food, for some dogs that's a toy. The reason we use the click is because for a dog to perform a behaviour and then for a reinforcer to happen, it takes 0.5 seconds for that link to be made. That's how quickly that pairing needs to happen. What we would have done historically was correct them for doing the wrong thing. So if they took you to the curb edge rather than the crossing box, they would maybe have had a physical correction for that. Just to add from that, because I've been taught both ways, been in the association I think now for about 18 years, so corrections, we used to use half checks, which are half collar, half chain, which tightens on the dog neck, so you would be encouraged to quickly, sharply whip the lead, so it tightened on the dog's neck and then released. It also made quite a noise. Um, The other thing we would use and teach clients to use is handle corrections, where you would get the handle, you would lift it up in the air and flick it down, so again, it would jerk the dog backwards and away. We did reward, maybe not as much food reward, but we would use physical reward, but alongside that, we would use punishment, so we kind of use both ways. Right. I mean, what I'm trying to get my head around here is, I mean, I'm not a guide dog owner, but I have always been a dog owner. And what I would do if a dog is doing something that it shouldn't do, I would not hit it. I would say no, very firmly. And in my experience, that works. What's different about what you're doing here? One thing that's massively different is, you know, you can say no to your dogs, but essentially what that is, is that's just an interrupter. So it's interrupting an unwanted behaviour. And that is something that we do. I think a big myth within guide dogs is that we don't say no to our dogs. We do sometimes say no. We also use other interrupters like a collar hold. So if a dog is really gluing themselves to a sniff, we'll take hold of their collar, we'll gently move them away, we'll pause and then we'll tell them a cue or a command that we actually do want for them. So in that instance, it would be straight on. So rather than punishing the unwanted behaviour, we're telling the dog what we do want instead with very clear cues that they do understand, like straight on, forward, left or right. Right. Now, I know you'll say, well, when current owners get a dog, because we'll have trained them, they won't behave badly. But I want you to kind of explain to me what happens for an owner who has got a dog with persistent bad behaviour, you know. What are they supposed to do? Because I think people's instinctive thing will be to tell the dog not to do it. Yeah, so I mean, for a start, class training is five weeks. So whether you've had no dogs before or five dogs before, every dog is different. You will be trained how to work specifically with that dog that has been matched so carefully to you so we train them probably in most cases using platforms to walk past the good things to get a better thing at the platform or at the curb edge for some dogs that's always going to be a bit hard so we do have management techniques that we use I don't think before step any guide dog owner would probably say that their dog never sniffed um they did and you know that was that's always been an issue because of what we're working with we're working with dogs Mm. and they have instincts and they follow them it's just now the issue is reduced because as Emma said the fact that they want to get where they're going because when they get to the curb they get the food they get the reward that was my question in a way which you've cleverly anticipated it works well for the dogs is this more dog orientated than it is people I think we have a duty if we are going to use dogs to sort of help us out as humans we have a duty to look after their welfare and that's both physically and emotionally and mentally and that's what this does there's no denying that before we trained guide dogs we trained them to a good standard they went out and they changed people's lives it did work what I would say now is I have dogs that are more positive they're more willing to engage with the handler and engage with the task they look happier and by that I mean their tails are up their ears are forward so it's not that the old way didn't work and this way has fixed every problem it's just that it makes a happier more confident dog which is then more likely to get things right which is then in turn keeping our guide dog owners safer blonde girl so when she qualified i said there you go you know what some people used to say about blondes don't you i said well you can't say that about her because it ain't true (laughs) eric griffiths is on his fourth guide dog tilly she's lying in front of us so that means eric that you've had three dogs that were trained if you like that were old school and tilly who's been trained under the step method What's the difference? Right, well, the first couple of days I was out working with Tilly, one of the most obvious things was when we were sat at the curb, 
I used to push off on the harness with my older dogs. Now we don't do that. And that was a very difficult habit to get out of. All my dogs have been very, very successful. And it's the way us as guide are going to engage with our dogs after training as well. I have a lot more confidence when I go into a restaurant or a pub, she will find an empty seat, she will find the seat of bus stations and bus stops for me, whereas before that didn't really happen. You'll know, I'm sure, that some guide dog owners are not happy about step. Some people say you need that kind of firmness with a dog to get good results. I haven't come across that with my new dog yet because every time there's been an incident like with a dog coming past, snapping and growling at her, I've just been very calm in the situation and let the situation pass. So I've never had to have any issues where I've had to be really firm with her. It is quite common with a lot of guided guns that they don't like the step method. You know, it's unfortunate because I think it does work. I mean, what do they say? Why do you think they don't? I think basically because we're old school and it's very difficult to get out of an old school into a new school routine. They feel the dogs are not responding as well. But I think it's all a matter in your voice and how you deal with the situation is how it resolves itself. Mm. Just tell me a bit more about how you use Tilly, what Tilly enables you to do. The biggest thing is cars parking on the pavement so she avoids me walking into them and bin days are the worst where the bin men just throw all the bins in the middle of the pavement and leave them. (laughs) Other obstacles where councils believe that when they build a new road that putting a lamppost right slap bang in the middle of the pavement is the best thing to do not realising that we're going to walk into that so she helps me avoid all obstacles of everyday life which I appreciate. Ready? Yep. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Keep on. Find the way. Good boy. This is just a, a zigzag type course where we've got obstacles in the way, like traffic cones. And That's Tim Stafford, Director of Canine Affairs at Guide Dogs. Start working on the platforms, yeah. get the dogs used to platform to platform working, mm. then put one obstacle in the way. So the dog learns to avoid that obstacle to get to the next platform, expand the distance, put two obstacles in the way, three obstacles, we put baby's buggies in. We've got um, stuffed dogs as well, like life-size stuffed dogs that we put in the way when we're starting to teach um, dogs to ignore other dogs. Then we might put a stuffed dog in in the first instance because the first couple of times, dogs will often react to a stuffed dog in the same way as they would a real dog. But it's a good way of when we talk about errorless learning and you want to give the dog something easy that the dog will get right and then you can reinforce the right behaviour. And then we can start saying, okay, so we're going to replace the stuffed dog with a dog that looks a bit like that stuffed dog. So if we use a Labrador as a stuffed dog, we could put a Labrador in. And then we can say, well, it now needs to ignore a Jack Russell Terrier and a great day. (laughs) Tim Stafford, first of all, why was the step method adopted? I've been involved in training dogs for over 40 years, 38 years in guide dog organisations. When I kind of reflect back over my career there's been such a difference in how we think about and interact with our dogs and that in many ways mirrors general societal changes as well how we treat our children how we treat people in the workplace things have changed and we really challenged ourselves on our established techniques which is was there a different way a better way and a more ethical way to train our dogs. And so that was the start of the thinking around what has now become our step methodology. We wanted to train our dogs as efficiently and effectively as we can, but also as ethically as we can as well. We believe that using our step methodology, we can get the same level of success. In fact, actually, during our pilot project, we're seeing more success out of our step methodology than less. But this is, if you like, a method which is applied across the board But dogs differ, you know, just like human beings. Does this really suit all dogs? Yes, it does suit all dogs, but every dog and every person is indeed an individual. So we have to have flexibility. When we started looking at the project in 2016, 2017, that was actually starting to take the form of different trainers coming into the organisation and starting to experiment with uh, clicker training, for example. But we couldn't have a clicker trainer in Atherton and then a traditional trainer in Exeter because the dog might go from one to the other and the dog would just get completely confused by those different training methods. But if a dog doesn't respond to this 
form of training, does that mean it fails? Because you certainly don't have a 100% success rate with dogs, do you? No, we don't. We have in the region of 60% success rate at the moment, which is lower than it was before the pandemic, but getting better. But the important thing is we've never had 100% success rate using any technique. So as long as our new approach at least meets the same standard as the previous technique, then kind of why wouldn't you train your dogs more ethically if you could, and achieve the same results. But I can remember times when it was claimed that you were getting something like an 80% rate success, which is a lot higher than 61%. Certainly, we were up in kind of about the 70% success rate before the pandemic. But uh, the pandemic has had such a huge impact upon our ability to socialise our dogs. And we're now in that position that our dogs coming into training now are post-pandemic dogs. So we're going to start to see that climb. And the other point that I think you just have to be honest about is when you're changing some methodology within an organisation, it takes time to retrain your staff. We had, and we have, around about 250 different trainers across different training roles. And so it takes a while to reach out to all of those people to start providing them with that professional development that they need. So it's to be expected that not all of our trainers who are going through a transition of their own learning will be automatically as proficient as they would have been in the past. But Tim, if this method produces effective partnerships, why is the number of successful working partnerships going down 5,000 a few years ago, around 5,000, somewhere around 3,600 now. That hasn't got anything to do with the STEP methodology. That has everything to do with the pandemic effect. During the pandemic year, we bred less than 450 puppies as opposed to 12 to 1,400 puppies. And it takes us two years for a puppy to become a partner. So obviously there is a time lag between recovering from the pandemic. And during that time, dogs are ageing and dogs are being retired, and they're not being replaced in the same numbers as they were in the past. Mm. So we are actively now catching up with that. We've got 1,200 puppies currently out in the community being raised. Our breeding numbers are pretty much back to where they were before. We've got in the region of 600 dogs in training now. So we're playing catch-up, but it is playing catch-up with the pandemic. I do understand the effect of COVID, and I think most people do, but critics say that those numbers started to go down in 2017, long before COVID, and in the same year that the STEP method was introduced. Coincidence? Yeah, more a correlation, Peter, is the answer to that question. What we also had at that time was organisationally, we had quite a large percentage of the workforce retiring as well. So I'm talking about our business critical roles, such as our guide dog mobility specialists. Any guide dog programme anywhere in the world relies on three fundamental pieces to to be sustainable. It's finances, it's having trained people who can deliver the job, and it's having sufficient dog supply. If any one of those things fail, then the service becomes very vulnerable. And to correct that, we're obviously addressing the dog supply issues now. We've got more than 90 new trainers and uh, guide dog mobility specialists currently in training. We're rebuilding our workforce, we're rebuilding our dog supply. How evidence-based is the belief that STEP results in quicker and more plentiful successful partnerships? We did that piece of research in 2020. Um, So looking back at the very early partnerships that were coming out using STEP methodology, they were training in 30% quicker times with about the same success rate, in actual fact, slightly higher. There's overwhelming scientific evidence in support of the training methodology in terms of science-based learning theory. And if you look at all of the other organisations involved in training dogs, welfare organisations, if you look at their position statements, you will find that they all talk about positive reinforcement training. So you're saying that maybe the issue about how quickly it can be done is not necessarily so clear cut, but the end result you're saying is much more effective. The end result is at least as good, if not better, than the previous results. Clearly, if we can get the cycle times, how long a dog takes to train, the quicker you can train a dog, the quicker that dog can go into partnership. So, of course, that is a driver for us. We would love to train our dogs as fast as we possibly could, but they still have to be good guide dogs. And those two things together, once we've got the proficiency that we're seeking within our workforce... We've got absolute confidence that this will be a way that we can get the guide dog service completely back on track, 
the waiting list coming down and so on. And we can already see the evidence of that happening now. Tim Stafford, Director of Canine Affairs at Guide Dogs. And now it's your turn. Next week, we'll be hosting a question and answer session with Guide Dogs where the questions come from you. We welcome points raised by tonight's programme, but also other issues that you'd like to raise about the service you get and the way the organisation works. You can email in touch at bbc.co.uk or you can leave your voice message, preferably in the form of a question, on 0161 836 1338. That's it for tonight. From me, Peter White, producer Beth Hemmings and studio manager Simon Highfield, goodbye.